Uh, yes, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I'm just, you know, making certain settings. Uh, I appreciate your patience. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Hi, Prash. Yeah, good afternoon, Vinod. Good Thank afternoon. you so much for uh, I'm just making some settings. Uh, yeah, I hope sure. everything is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one minute, please. Yeah. Hello. Hello there. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, welcome. I hope it is audible. Yeah. Yeah. You can hear and see me. Yes. Yes. Yes, please, sir. Um, we'll just get started in about uh, uh, ten minutes, twelve to uh, ten to twelve minutes. So I uh, appreciate your patience, sir. One minute. Yeah. Yeah. I will keep my video and audio mute in the meantime. Yeah. 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 Please. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you very much, you know, for those uh, who are joining, and um, you know, the many personal messages, you know, uh, uh, are being uh, uh, made. I'm sorry, unfortunately, I can't answer you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, answer you all, you know, in person. But you know, please be advised that you know this uh, panel discussion is going to be recorded. So, so, so please don't don't worry. You know, if, even if you even if you even if you you know uh, can't attend this or uh, you can't make it. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everyone. We are going to get started in about eight to nine minutes' time. So please uh, appreciate your patience. So we'll get started. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, Dr. Hello, sir. Yeah. Dr. Prash, how are you? Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for joining. Uh, sir, I hope everyone is uh, around. So it's about 2.59 PM. We'll get started in about one minute time. Uh, okay. I just want to uh, uh, be sure if uh, Professor Srinivasan is around. OK. Very good. Hello, Dr. Srinivasan. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, I had kept my um, both video and audio mute. Uh, yeah, good to see you again. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. Sir, would you please yeah. unmute? Uh, 
unmute and uh, unmute, unmute your audio. Of course, you have done it, and uh, your video as well, please. Yeah. So uh, should we put it on mute or unmute? Yeah, unmute, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 Vinod and uh, 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 Dr. Urmila, please. Yeah. 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 I, th I think you're already there. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Yes, I think we know this to join. I think, um, yeah. So only the uh, panelists will have the muted, unmuted, or everybody is unmuted. Uh, so it's only it's only uh, uh, the panelists, you four and me, okay. uh, who will have access to both audio and video. Okay. So the rest uh, will only be in uh, listen-only mode. Okay. okay. I don't think uh, I have the video on. Do we? Uh, so it's not mandatory, but it would be nice if uh, the audience can see. No, uh, can see video. You. Where is the video? I, I can't. Uh... Um. I think I think there is a video symbol, so you can click it. Uh, last time you could click that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you are already on, and now you have turned it on. Okay. okay. No, I, I I put it on, but I can't see you guys. But that's okay. If yeah. I am on, that is good enough. That's fine. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Vinod. Uh, Vinod. I think he just left the meeting. I don't know. There there was some uh, can you hear me? problems. I guess. No, he's here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, so, uh, so thank you so much, you know, uh, everyone, uh, for uh, making your uh, busy schedule, you know, for us. Uh, thank you, and we are absolutely delighted to have you all. Uh, so, this is uh, called as an e-interaction and panel discussion. Um, nevertheless, you know, there are uh, some other words that are used, like webinars and all. In webinars, you know, there are, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, screen uh, that is shared or uh, uh, slides that are shared. So here, uh, we just wanted. Uh, to ensure that all the elite uh, panelists uh, discuss about the computational biology perspective of the known unknowns of this uh, COVID-19. Um, there has been an absolute paraphernalia going around with COVID-19, uh, a lot of fake news, and uh, many young uh, uh, enthusiasts uh, are also worried about uh, uh, the scientific uh, reason and detail behind this uh, COVID-19 and as well. And, and as well, you know, uh, many of them, you know, wanted to work on uh, some aspects of uh, COVID-19 towards computational biology perspective. And um, as someone, you know, uh, 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 who has extensively worked on these areas, we thought, you know, you four are uh, uh, wonderful speakers. And um, thank you so much, you know, for your time. Uh, so friends, um, you know, we are absolutely delighted to have uh, these elite uh, panelists. There are about uh, 147 registrants for this, and as of now, I could see only 49. But uh, I think you know they might you know uh, keep coming because um, there are few participants coming from Australia and US and Europe. So, uh, however, uh, in any case, you know this video is recorded. So uh, please allow me to uh, quickly introduce the four panelists today. Um, uh, the first one is uh, uh, Professor P. Ratnagiri. Uh, he is um, a PhD. Uh, from University of Madras, uh, and he obtained his PhD under the guidance of uh, Professor Nayudamma, the then CSAR DG. And um, he moved uh, to US and then uh, he worked for uh, uh, Emory University and uh, several other universities in US, and most importantly, worked for National Institute of Health. And um, uh, he worked extensively for defense uh, uh, research in, um, uh, in the US. And he's also a board of advisors for several universities and several uh, uh, institutes in US and India. And most importantly, he has uh, extensively worked on several diagnostics. Uh, he, he was instrumental in developing a lot of diagnostic kits, a lot of you know, viral diagnostic kits uh, that have been widely used uh, in and around. Uh, next is uh, Professor uh, N. Srinivasan. Uh, he is uh, a distinguished professor at uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, is uh, a computational uh, structural biologist. Uh, it, it is um, uh, postdoctoral uh, uh, works uh, works in uh, in the UK uh, and primarily with uh, Professor uh, uh, Tom Blundell and uh, several other elite folks. And uh, if uh, uh, and if there is um, something you know that 
you want to know uh, uh, about Professor Srinivasan is uh, that he is an amazing uh, orator, a wonderful structural biologist, and an absolutely a very uh, a friendly uh, uh, person. Uh, I think I think uh, ever since this COVID-19 has come into picture, uh, he along with his student have uh, extensively uh, worked on a pilot uh, studies on structural biology of, of, of COVID. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, sir is here. And it's always you know, nice hearing to him. Uh, third one is uh, Professor uh, Urmila Kulkani Kalesh. She's an information scientist at Savitri Bai Pune University. Uh, and uh, she has extensively worked on the evolution of viruses and the diversity of these viruses the last uh, two decades. Uh, she has been instrumental in develop, uh, developing the Bioinformatics Center at uh, Pune University. And uh, she's also the Women in Biology Chair of BioClues. Um, and of course, Vinod Skarya. Uh, Vinod Skarya also needs no mention. Is a, uh, uh, is, is a genomics uh, leader from India. He's a senior scientist at the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in Delhi. Uh, he has been um, instrumental in uh, uh, developing a lot of, you know, uh, computational resources and as well as, you know, wet lab resources, you know, coalescing uh, the genomic interface. He always tried, tries to bridge uh, the clinicians and the geneticists. And the beauty with him is uh, he's a PhD uh, after, after his MBBS degree. And uh, most importantly, uh, is also uh, the leader for this Genome India Initiative project. So, uh, without wasting you know much of uh, uh, you know their valuable time, I think you know we should go. Uh, we should you know uh, straight away uh, go ahead you know asking uh, some some of the important questions. So, what uh, we are trying to do uh, at this uh, point of time is uh, we will first uh, start with uh, Vinod Skarya. And uh, the other three panelists uh, could also uh, answer some of the questions. And it quickly, you know, after asking you know, a couple of questions, uh, we will immediately go to uh, the other three panelists based on the diagnostics and the viral uh, uh, heterogeneity and the structural aspects. And uh, uh, everyone is uh, welcome to post some questions in the chat box, uh, uh, which we've already selectively screened, you know, some of the questions when we at the end of this panel discussion. I'll uh, selectively choose one or two questions and uh, ask the panelists on your behalf. Okay. Unfortunately, you don't have any access to the uh, to the microphone or uh, or 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 or, or uh, audio. Okay. So so thank you so much. Uh, so the very first question probably uh, I would like to ask. You know this. Uh, uh, you know the how how different is uh, this novel coronavirus? You know from uh, other uh, beta coronaviridae family members. Could you please throw, throw, throw light on this you know, to the audience? Yeah, so in, in terms of the genome, they're pretty much very close and very similar. Right. Uh, and that's essentially why um, the, the sort of uh, number of conclusive papers which suggest that uh, the novel coronavirus actually evolved out of uh, one of the beta coronaviridae. Right. which now can also recognize human receptors and can uh, now get transmitted to humans. Right, right. Uh, can, you, can you please throw uh, a light on uh, the kind of uh, uh, research that you have been going through on these uh, area, you know, uh, I can see that you have wonderfully uh, benchmarked certain uh, uh, pipelines for assemblies and all. So can you, can you please uh, give a gist about this? Yeah, yeah so... Um, in, in in any given uh, epidemic situation, one of the one of the set of people who are sought after is after the clinicians, of course, the epidemiologist, and then of course the bioinformaticians. And uh, as you would rightly recognize, um, the virus is um, doubling the number of positives every once in every five days. And you would also recognize that the genomes that are available in public domain are also multiplying once in every six days or seven days at this moment. Right. Um, so what that necessarily means that um, as the epidemic grows, the number of genome sequences, number of publications, number of research reports on the epidemic are also going to grow exponentially. Right. Now what's really important in this scenario is to essentially put together this information so that they can be distilled and made available to downstream experimental biologists to be able to build 
They are tools and resources. This could be diagnostics on one hand, this could be vaccines, this could be looking at repurposing therapeutics, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a, uh, there's a large role for bioinformaticians to actually put this information together, understand the biological context, and make it available for downstream validation. Right, right. So, uh, so, so take, taking, taking by and large, if you really see the last few, uh, you know, uh, epidemics, uh, you know, especially in India, like the Nipah or the Zika and all, uh, most of these particular samples, you know, uh, uh, that were sequenced, you know, the bench sample was nothing but the blood. But in this case, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, it varies. You know, the most uh, primordial sample is a nasopharyngeal sample. So do you think, you know, from the bioinformatics uh, analysis point of view, from the assembly point of view, uh, uh, how does it augur well, you know, towards, you know, making, you know, some kind of you know, challenges of the assembly? So, um, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right in the sense uh, that um, nasal samples come with its own challenges because there is also other microbes uh, which are supposed to be there in the normal nasal flora, which also get sequenced. But having said that, um, now that we have the throughput and the capacity and the technology to sequence a large amount of data, um, right. what people have attempted doing and what we have also tried doing was to essentially uh, sequence the virus right from the nasal swabs. Right. Uh, this also provides uh, additional information about the nasal flora. But of course, you do get enough uh, data to assemble genomes. Right. It is challenging, but uh, you do get enough data to assemble genomes. Right, right, right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah uh, thank you so much, Vinod. I think we'll uh, quickly get back to you later. Uh, sir, so having said this, I mean, this question is uh, uh, to Professor Ratnagiri. Um, uh, sir, there is a lot of uh, uh, discussions on the hydro hydroxychloroquine on, uh, chloroquine and, and other malarial drugs you know, for treating COVID. I mean, I mean, how viable are these and what are the limitations in terms of, you know, uh, uh, diagnostics or theranostic front? Okay, hydroxychloroquine, usually we use it for malaria and right. it is basically used for the anti-malarial drug chloroquine and, and uh, hydroxychloroquine. And unfortunately, or fortunately, this was stuck only in the India and also African countries where the tropical areas where the malaria is one of the major disease. But right. fortunately, now what happened is it became the right fit in the right storm to attack the COVID-19. Uh, and now America suddenly started realizing after going through all these uh, problems, now suddenly they started realizing hydroxychloroquine is the right drug along with the other uh, normal antiviral drugs. That is one point. So there is so much demand all over the world and only India is the only the source right now they are manufacturing the hydroxychloroquine all fronts. And now regarding the diagnostic point of it, as Dr. Vino said, the, it is having the homology with the other uh, SARS as well as MERS uh, uh, viruses. And now identifying the COVID-19 is also a challenge because right now we want to identify the COVID-19. If you look at the genome, and there are four important genes that are targeted as a diagnostic point of fit. These are the especially when the diagnostic point when we discuss, we always talk to the what are the epitopes that can be recognized very quickly, easily, simple, and rapid. These are the important things what we put in the uh, profile in, in the in designing a, a diagnostic testing. Now, number one is the spike protein. Right. Number two is a nuclear, I think we discussed about this things in several platforms. Number two is nuclear capsid. And third one is membrane-bound proteins and envelope proteins. These, out of the so many genes, why are we targeting about these things? Because these epitopes are important to diagnostic point of view. There are two kinds of diagnostic we have all this. One is molecular diagnostics, where we can do the real-time PCR, though it is need, it needs a big lab and running a Yeah. Uh, 
looks like he is off. Yeah, uh, I think I think you know, uh, sir got disconnected. So maybe maybe uh, uh, I'll just quickly uh, uh, pass this on to Professor Srinivasan. Uh, sir, could you please uh, throw some uh, uh, challenges on this uh, uh, ENCO and the kind of works that uh, your lab has been doing the last uh, uh, three or four weeks? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, you know, we, we have been uh, interested in repurposing FDA-approved drugs. Um, over the last five, six years, we have been uh, doing it. We developed a computational framework um, to repurpose FDA-approved drugs. So, you know, basically what it's all about is uh, there are many drugs already uh, approved for practical use uh, available uh, across the counter in a pharmacy. And uh, all these have gone through very tight scrutiny, toxicology tests, and many th other things, you know, to, uh, uh, for the side effects and all that, and eventually approved by, by an authority like uh, uh, FDA. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, uh, a lot has been understood about these molecules, uh, which are now available in the form of tablets and injections and things. Now, um, of course, each of these, uh, of these, as medicines are against some health problems. It could be cancer, it could be, uh, it could be a bacterial infection, it could be anything. Uh, but the advantage is that a lot has been learned about uh, uh, those molecules. Uh, and now, um, um, if, if that could be, uh, if, a, if uh, uh, so let's say a drug which is used as an antibacterial uh, could also be um, used as an antiviral, uh, if you have uh, proper scientific reasons why we believe this, uh, then uh, the scrutiny um, for approving that as a drug against that viral problem uh, could be a lot less uh, than a brand new molecule. So it will save a lot of time. Now the current situation is that uh, this um, uh, this pathogen is probably very very senior to you in the evolutionary scale. You know, millions of years of evolution suddenly is at our doorstep, not giving a minute of time, and uh, you know, started attacking us, and then <laughs> uh, uh, and then you know killing people. So um, I think it is important that everybody does their bit, if at all they can think of doing something. If you know many different people come with the Thank same answer. It is probably the right uh, answer that one can develop confidence on. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so basically, we are you know repurposing FTI approved to start with, uh, but we are getting into other things also. Right, right, right. Thank you so much, sir. But but in general, if we if we really look into the uh, structural uh, front, sir, uh, hmm. I think uh, there's less uh, uh, amount of you know work on molecular structures of viruses in general. Can you hmm. throw light on this space? Yeah. Okay, uh, there are, uh, uh, I mean, the structure of viruses is a very, very old area. Uh, it is almost uh, like, you know, 40 years ago, I think the virus uh, structures were, have been determined using crystallography and many plant viruses and uh, animal viruses structures have been solved. Uh, and, um, um, you know, there are two kinds of things in the viral uh, structural biology, if you like. One is the overall viral particle structure. Uh, so that is solved, for example, uh, for uh, the SARS-CoV variants, some of the variants. Um, and then you also have, um, uh, you know, the genome of the virus coding for many so-called non-structural proteins that would encompass some critical enzymes as well. And um, and in in, in uh, and in the case of SARS CoV uh, and CoV two class of uh, class of viruses, uh, a number of uh, not a lot but uh, uh, some important protein structures have been solved. For example, uh, just yes, day before yesterday in Nature we we, um, we noted the main proteinase uh, uh, structure solved which is important in the autocleaving um, of the polyprotein after the RNA genome uh, has been employed in the human ribosome to synthesize the polyprotein. So uh, this, this main proteinase is essential to chop at the right places to get the functional uh, viral proteins. So that structure is solved, but in the protein data bank, uh, more than one month ago, the structures have been you know, deposited. We, 
we have been using those structures um, about, you know, from about a month ago now. So, but still many more structures have to be determined. And also many of these proteins, there is not a single structure. It may have more than one functional state. And it is important to understand the, uh, um, uh, you know, um, the forms, the, the structural forms of different functional states. That includes, for example, the spike, uh, spike protein, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Right, right. There is a lot right, to do. Right, wonderful, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful insights, sir. I think um, uh, uh, Professor Ratnagiri again lost the connection. Uh, but um, in the meantime, um, uh, uh, Dr. Urmila Kulkani Kare, ma'am, uh, can you please throw light on? Uh, the kind of works you know that your lab has been doing uh, on COVID ever since you know this uh, research has come into a big influential entity. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, so hello everyone, and uh, you know uh, let us uh, start from uh, very basic in the beginning. COVID nineteen refers to the name of the disease. The virus was initially named as NCOV nineteen. And subsequently, the virus has been renamed uh, as SARS-CoV-2 uh, to show similarity with uh, the beta coronaviruses, you know, uh, to which it belongs. So this particular virus, uh, which uh, you know emerged in late December uh, of 2019, uh, is a RNA virus, a positive stranded, uh, you know, a positive single stranded RNA virus. And, uh, uh, you know, RNA viruses in general evolve very quickly. Uh, however, they do also have a gene called as RDRP, uh, you know, a gene which is very vital, very important uh, as far as their replication is concerned. And in our lab, we have been, uh, you know, looking at uh, evolution of viruses in general and various evolutionary factors that shape the diversity of various viruses. And recently, after the months before uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, we analyzed, uh, you know, the RDRP gene sequences, the approach that we adopted, that there are more than, you know, today there are more than 7,000 genomes uh, available in public domain databases. But when we uh, analyzed this data, there were about 100 genomes. We extracted this sequence of RDRP, and we, we sort of looked at it from the perspective of population uh, genomics. So by that, you know, we looked, analyzed the uh, RDRP gene sequences of uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in comparison with the known coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses in particular, such as a SARS virus, the bat viruses, SARS-like bat viruses, and so on and so forth. And you know what we found uh, that you know this particular virus forms a homogeneous cluster. So uh, so it's an entity in itself, a new virus, um, and uh, you know it clusters uh, separately uh, as compared to other viruses uh, with a with a you know a membership score of one. Uh, if we look at uh, the other uh, viruses, then the SARS also is a homogeneous cluster, but we could see a lot of bat viruses which have, you know, mixed ancestry, and that is where, you know, this concept that, you know, they are harboring many more populations of viruses which have likely potential for emergence in future. So, you know, this is one piece of work that we have done. Uh, we have also predicted uh, the homology model of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, spike protein and compared it, put it in the perspective of the evolutionary analysis that we were doing uh, and also looked at uh, you know, uh, the B cell and T cell epitope prediction to see antigenically how similar, how different this virus is with that of the other viruses. So this is in right. a nutshell like what we have done. Right. Wonderful, ma'am. Uh, so uh, uh, coming, coming slightly into this particular context, since there are um, uh, about uh, four uh, important structural proteins in novel coronavirus, or for that matter, uh, the SARS uh, uh, human corona virus, uh, how, how important is uh, to understand uh, uh, these structures? I mean, uh, what kind of you know, differences probably you, know, you could find 
between uh, these four structural proteins of uh, novel coronavirus when compared to its predecessors. So, you want me to take that question? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, we have uh, analyzed, uh, you know, spike protein one structural protein, an RDRP, which is not a structural protein. And what we see is that uh, the virus has evolved and has mutated, uh, though it shows uh, certain sequence identity and similarity with the proteins of other viruses. For example, if you look at, uh, you know, comparison of spike protein at sequence level uh, with uh, that of these, uh, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 with the SARS-CoV, there are about, you know, 70% identity at, at the nucleotide level, and then it reflects into the protein as well. So, so they having said that there are some differences and there are some identities. Now, interesting question is, where are these differences uh, located? So if you look at, uh, you know, the, the receptor binding site, uh, you know, different beta coronaviruses have different profiles of amino acids. And this particular SARS-CoV-2, we found that, you know, um, uh, it has more similarity with the, in terms of, you know, uh, the receptor binding site, it showed more similarity with the virus uh, which comes from or has been characterized from pangolins as compared to some of the bat viruses. So this is uh, what we found. Right, right. Wonderful, wonderful, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, so the, uh, the following question is uh, for uh, Professor uh, Srinivasan. Uh, sir, uh, how, how important are uh, uh, the role of these uh, the exposed residues uh, for these structural proteins, especially you know, for uh, uh, determining, say, uh, antigens or say, you know, uh, epitopes or whatever. So, uh, what is the role of these exposed amino acid residues? And what if, say, uh, these exposed amino acid residues are surrounded by buried amino acid residues? So, uh, could we could we still uh, consider them as good targets? Okay. Um... Uh, you know, in the context of, uh, uh, you know, drugs against that, you know, binds to these proteins, um, there are, uh, uh, there are three kinds of sites one might like to target. The most popular site is the functional site. If you consider an enzyme like main protease, um, it, it, it has a catalytic uh, set of residues, cysteine, histidine, and a few things. Uh, and, um, uh, the most common um, form of inhibitors target this, um, uh, uh, I mean, the site where the chemistry actually happens, the cleavage happens. Uh, and once you block that site by uh, a drug molecule, then the protease is, uh, cannot bind to this natural substrate, which is the polyprotein, and therefore it cannot uh, cleave it. The polyprotein just synthesized can't cleave. So those proteins cannot uh, uh, be you no know, functional. They remain as polyprotein. That is, that, is, uh, that is in the ideal world. So this is one kind of drug directly targeting into the, act, uh, into the functional site. These are usually exposed. Very, very rarely functional sites are you know, buried. Uh, and then second kind of site is um, um, uh, you know, the interface of protein, protein complexes. You, you can um, see, for example, uh, when you when you take this, um, uh, you know, uh, the yes, uh, I mean, uh, the spike protein, um, th that, uh, yes, that yes. into the, uh, into, uh, into um, you know, your receptor protein. Uh, and so this is a just protein-protein interaction. So if you are able to interrogate it with um, a molecule that prevents this interaction, that is another thing. And the third kind of uh, drug is, actually the allosteric uh, uh, drugs. That is, uh, you know, what happens is that when you, uh, um, when, uh, you, you know, when, uh, when a small molecule binds at a site which is distant from the functional site, uh, spatially it is distant, but the binding of the small molecule at a distant site um, uh, triggers a series of cascade of structural alterations in the structural network, if you like, and then it, that information that traverses all the way to the functional site, altering either <coughs> the spatial geometry of the chemical groups responsible for the function 
or their dynamical properties. So, uh, you know, for, for an active site to be properly functional, it's not only not enough, the, the spatial, you know, the configuration of chemical groups are in right spatial, uh, spatial orientation. Also, the extent and direction of movements of those atoms and the chemical groups should be appropriate. So some, something that binds far away um, uh, can affect the, either the dynamics or structure or both of the, of the functions. So it is something like you just go to, if you want to turn on your ceiling fan, you go to your switch and you press it, it, it comes on, or you, you press it again, it goes off. So um, that's, an, that's, an, uh, you know, that's an allosteric drug. The second and third kind of drugs that, you know, protein-protein interaction, interfering drug and the allosteric drugs are lot more difficult uh, to design uh, um, and due to many practical uh, structural uh, reasons uh, the most common and attractive way is to uh, target the functional site that usually comes with the side effect of uh, you know hitting a functional site of a human protein for example so one has to be extremely careful but these are usually more targetable sites they, they are coming up with a crevice some sort of a shape um, that is usually uh, easier to target than the slippery surfaces like protein-protein interaction surfaces. Right, right. Wonderful, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful insights. Uh, so, so we know the back to you. Uh, you know, uh, I was just wondering, you know, where where are we heading to capture these uh, you know novel coronavirus uh, genomes, you know, from India? I can see that there are a couple of them, you know, from National Institute of Virology. Uh, could you please throw light on this and? Uh, and parallelly, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I see that you're also uh, this genomics leader, you know, for uh, Genome India uh, Initiative project. So do you think, you know, these uh, uh, human genome sequencing would really help anyways uh, to understand uh, maybe um, uh, the, the, the antimicrobial uh, uh, entities or any kind of, you know, uh, uh, pathogenicity drivers, you know, uh, from, uh, you know, in, in, in ascertaining these, uh, you know, coronaviruses or, or, or the like, yeah. Yeah, coming to your first question, yes, the, uh, um, the initial genomes uh, out now from India, this includes two genomes which are deposited a few weeks ago from the National Institute of Biology. And very recently, there are another seven more genomes which have been deposited from the National Institute of Biology. Um, so apart from that, uh, as you would have also seen in news, CSI has announced the sequencing of a large number of coronavirus genomes from across the country. Uh, at the moment, we are still in the mode of sample collection. Uh, and uh, the idea is to essentially um, talk to everybody who is willing to work with us uh, to be able to sequence genomes. And the idea of doing those genomes is to also make this data publicly available so that people can look at it, people can make assumptions on top of it. Right. Um, we are also in parallel releasing one of the largest compendiums of coronavirus genomes. Uh, uh, early this week, we will have this released, right. which as of today encompasses close to around 7,000 odd coronavirus genomes from across the world. This includes uh, the ones which are deposited into databases like GenBank, uh, in the GSA, as well as into institutional data repositories, as well as available on public websites like, for example, GitHub. Right. Now, coming to your second question, yes, human genetic variations and um, and the possible and the possibility of um, uh, changing the susceptibility of an individual is something that is um, uh, widely hypothesized. There are a lot of publications which are available, including a, a, a recent publication uh, in uh, in one of the preprint uh, preprint archives from the IIIT in Delhi, which looked at the uh, the 1,000 genomes which are part of the Indie Genome Consortium to be able to look at variants in the ACE2 gene. Um, in trying to understand are there correlates um, which can potentially be useful in uh, looking for patients. Now, having said this, um, um, what's really important to keep in mind is that there is no conclusive evidence as of, as of now. Uh, there's a lot of hypothesis uh, and a lot of information which is available. And um, yeah, the real, the real fact will come after the epidemic once um, somebody can really look at the prevalence of individuals who died of coronavirus versus prevalence of individuals uh, who, who got cured. So that's, right. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Vinod. Uh, something, something on these lines, uh, uh, Vinod. Uh, you know, uh, there's a big uh, divide between you know uh, clinicians and genomicists or molecular biologists in India. I know you, you, have, you have been instrumental in bridging this particular gap. Uh, uh, I think, I think this is high time. You know, the clinicians you know should really meet uh, the geneticists or the genomicists or uh, the molecular biologists. So, uh, how do you think you know that this is going to shape you know post COVID in India? Yeah, I think the problem is uh, not just with clinicians or with uh, researchers. The problem is at both ends. Um, the, uh, I mean, very unlikely a researcher will ever work on a problem um, on a clinical problem that the clinician thinks is relevant, and and vice versa, of course. Um, so. What needs to be bridged is uh, not really that people should keep talking to each other, but also be able to uh, make friends across uh, the spectrum of silos. Um, and, and this is true with anything that has to do with translation. You have to go across silos and you need to make friends. And practically all collaborations start with friendship. So I think that's the only thing that I can sort of say at this point of time, that as long as you can make friends across the different silos and you can at least understand a start talking in their language. Um, right. Yeah, that's what is more important than anything else. Right. Uh, very nicely inserted, you know, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Ma'am, this is, uh, you know, for you. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, uh, if you really look back, there are very few viral biologists or viral uh, bioinformaticists, uh, uh, not only in India, but, you know, uh, abroad as well, in uh, overseas as well. So I was just wondering, you know, uh, is it... Uh, also, you know, uh, linking to this, uh, just because, you know, we have got very few viral biologists, we have got, you know, very few uh, resources, especially for RNA viruses. And uh, uh, is, it, uh, is it also, again, because if you really see uh, the single-stranded RNA viruses, there are very few, but they have been absolutely phenomenal. They're absolutely pathogenic. And uh, there are a lot of, you know, bioinformatics challenges. So, so what, what best advice probably you could... Uh, give to a budding bioinformaticist if he or she you know, wants to you know, uh, do some uh, you know, enticing research uh, in this area? Yeah. So I, I strongly believe that uh, challenges and opportunities go hand in hand. Uh, and COVID-19 is one of the best example of it. So just like what we know said that you know, people have to come out of silos and start collaborating. So probably bioinformatics, you know, is, uh, facilitates dialogues, uh, you know, between uh, uh, between the scientists coming from multiple disciplines. So I believe that bioinformaticians uh, have a very good role to play here. Uh, just like that, they need to talk to each other. Availability of data is another very critical and crucial factor, and probably. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a very uh, phenomenal example from disease emergence to today that we are talking about in a less than three months time. We have huge amount of data from genomes to proteomes to, you know, all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the chemists coming up with um, molecular modelers coming up with repurposing vaccine people coming up with starting with genomic sequences to identify, you know, candidate uh, for vaccine design. So, so it is also availability of data. And once you have, you know, huge amount of data available, you need to curate and compile this data. Uh, in a systematic fashion so that you know everybody can make best use of this data so i would just like to give here a small example based on what uh, professor shrinivasan spoke uh, spike protein you see you have this uh, uh, ac receptor binding site and when we developed the model uh, you know we realized that for sars virus uh, the, the, the old SARS, SARS virus, there were a couple of antibodies which were sort of shown to competitively bind uh, uh, in the same region. And then we looked at this analysis at the sequence and structure level, and then there was a study which was published say that uh, these antibodies, uh, group of antibodies, do not recognize or bind to SARS-CoV-2. So you can you can you know then look at uh, the mutations in the perspective uh, in terms of gain or loss of a function. So having said this, from genome uh, to function, 
from variations to, to repurposing or antigenic modeling uh, for all these uh, you know tasks to undertake you need uh, you know good resources and uh, data is plenty uh, we need people to look at this data annotate this data to make sense out of this data because everyday data is uh, increasing uh, at a phenomenal rate so there are always opportunities having said that there are some very good resources a few of them uh, we know mentioned uh, but in general every virus uh, you know uh, is an entity is a story uh, to unfold so uh, though some of the common methodologies and approaches would work for every virus you also need virus specific probing in terms of data analytics uh, to sort of decipher the mystery uh, that the virus is uh, told right right uh, perfect ma'am uh, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful insertion uh, so uh, i think you know my uh, question again uh, goes back uh, to uh, vinod unfortunately you know we are not able to uh, have uh, you know professor ratnagiri you know for some reasons when i spoke to him as well you know there are some connection problems up front um, but you know i'm sure that you know vinod uh, uh, and other panelists you know, could really answer this so so my uh, uh, particular question was you know uh, towards uh, the diagnostic front so there are a lot of you know rapid diagnostic kits that have been imported from china ever since you know, this outbreak you know came into picture there are also some rapid diagnostic kits you know that have been developed in india and of course you now uh, you know uh, uh, comet uh, uh, genome sequencing of this uh, virus there are a lot of you know pcr based uh, diagnostic kits you know that are uh, uh, made available just recently so uh, how how different are these i mean i mean how sensitive are these how specific are these uh, you know could you please throw light to our audience yeah so um, largely speaking uh the the kind of tests that are used to uh diagnose screen uh, or do tracing of individuals and viruses could be divided into three one and which is the mainstay of diagnosis is what we call as a rt pcr based technique and the idea of rt pcr based technique is that you have primers or probes which target very specific regions in the viral genome and then if you if you can target those regions so you can amplify it and of course uh, get a readout and this readout will tell whether there is virus in that sample or there is no virus in the sample the second approach is of course to do something which is not a cd based test and the idea of doing serology based test is that uh, when you get infected with a particular pathogen you develop antibodies against that pathogen and you essentially look for antibodies against a particular antigen Uh, using a, a CART test or an ELISA-based test um, to look at whether you you have been infected with that particular kind of virus. And the third approach uh, is also what I said uh, earlier is to be able to sequence the virus right from the sample. Now there are advantages and limitations to each of these technologies. RT-PCR-based technologies are positive very early on during infection, and then th therefore can be used for case detection. but one of the limitations of rt pcr based technologies is that the numbers of false negatives are quite significantly large in one of the papers published earlier this month it has suggested that they could at least have around 40% of false negatives using rt pcr test so that necessarily means that if you have a positive test on rt pcr of course that is very important to look at but if you have a negative test that doesn't mean that you do not have the disease Now, the second type of test what i said is serology based test the advantages of serology based test is that it could be widely deployed because elisa kits or cart test are pretty much stable and can be deployed across large numbers uh, disadvantages of test is that you need to have at least 7 uh, 5 days to 7 days before the antibodies turn out positive after the point of infection and the third uh, method that i sort of mentioned is whole genome based sequencing Uh, this has been widely deployed across china and in many european countries now uh, including the united kingdom and the idea of this is that it is not based on any a prior information we are going to take the sample and sequence it and figure out what is the virus in there the advantage is that uh, even if the virus mutates you will be able to figure out uh, 
that the virus is in there because it's not dependent upon any a prior information about the virus. It's not dependent upon any probes that capture the virus. It's only dependent upon that the nucleic acid is present in the sample. The disadvantages, of course, is that there is limitations in the numbers that you can sequence. You cannot really look at uh, do sequencing for large scale diagnosis or screening. But more importantly, you can look at it uh, at a point of epidemiology, trying to understand what are the viral strains in a particular population, how is the viral strain spreading uh, for a community infection, can I identify the original contact of this individual, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vinod. I mean, um, thank you so much. Uh, so, certain ma'am, would you like to uh, uh, have any comments on this? Uh, would you like to add any points? Srinivasan, would you like to take it first? Um, I mean, on the diagnostic part? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, on, on, on the sidelines of this, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Actually, um, um, what Binod told is quite lucid, and uh, I have you know nothing really to add on to what Binod said. Um, uh, in it was quite educational that there are uh, you know a few ways of you know, these things work, and uh, uh, I hope uh, yeah, robust uh, uh, the diagnostic uh, kit that could be commonly used will be um, will be out in the public soon. So, uh, I mean, uh, not a comment, but probably a question to be known. Uh, that uh, I came to know that uh, India is going to go for the uh, group uh, sort of uh, testing instead of individual. And uh, how would you, uh, you know, uh, rate this in terms of PCR-based, uh, uh, you know, diagnostic, which is more specific as compared to group-based uh, test, which have been around for many years we know okay. uh, pardon me i did i didn't get your point uh, okay. you're asking uh, how, how what's the difference between uh, the serology based test and the nucleotide based test uh, not, not necessarily uh, the the serology based test i just read uh, you know and and heard on tv that uh, you know uh, as far as epidemiological uh, you know and the screening program of india you know soon we are planning to embark on group testing some kind of pool, pool seek pool, pool, pool pool yeah. testing yeah. Yeah. So, what is your take on pooled versus uh, PCR-based diagnostics? Yeah, so, pooled, pooled uh, analysis is also based on real-time PCR at this moment. And the idea of pooled uh, samples is, uh, is very simple. Um, so, typically, what, uh, what if you had all the money to do and all the resources to do, what you could do is to actually do testing for practically a large number of individuals probably mm -hmm. one in every 10 or one in every 100 individuals if you had all the resources. But of course, in times of limited resources and limited capability, what you need to do is to be able to optimize uh, the kind of uh, testing that is available. So this testing is not for identifying cases or not trying to sort of diagnose a case, but this is essentially going to be a screening test. And the idea of the screening test is that you use a very sensitive test to be able to look at a pooled set of samples with the idea that if the pool turns out positive, then you know that there is one individual in this particular locality or this particular family or this particular cluster who is positive. Now, that needs to be, of course, followed up on an individual case-to-case -case follow. -up. But then the idea is that you optimize your resources to be able to reach to a larger number of testing with very li limited or minimal kind of resources. Uh, different countries have thought of doing this. It's not just only India is doing this and only India has thought about doing this. Different countries have started thinking about doing it. And of course, different countries have also, in some cases, implemented this in at least a pilot scenario. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful. I thought of asking you this question on behalf of all the students who have been listening to us, you know, and as a supplementation to what Prash asked you about testing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Vinod and ma'am. You know, that was, and also, sir, you know, that was wonderful. Uh, so something uh, on these lines, and uh, please be assured that uh, Professor Giri is joining, is taking up another computer. So, so uh, something more on, on, on towards uh, the diagnostics, uh, you, know, you know, there is a lot of uh, 
work on plasma intervention therapy uh, therapy and uh, i was told that um, you know three researchers in europe um, have wonderfully uh, transplanted plasma from uh, uh, from the treated uh, patients to uh, uh, to those particular um, uh, patients who are undergoing uh, these particular intervention therapies so so how promising is this plasma intervention therapy and do you think that you know the current isolate of uh, novel coronavirus especially you know the strain you know, that is prevailing in uh, asia would really make a merry you know for this plasma intervention therapy yeah so the idea of uh, plasma therapy is quite uh, simple and to put it this way if one individual gets infected with the virus and he recovers from the infection that necessarily means that you have enough immune uh, the antibodies in the system which can handle the virus and then therefore the idea is that if you can take plasma from these individuals uh, could you enrich for these antibodies either right from the plasma in terms of uh, plasma units that could be transferred or in terms of antibodies that could be enriched from this plasma and transferred back to individuals who otherwise cannot produce these antibodies in sufficient numbers to be able to recover from the infection now in 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 technicality this looks very simple uh, but the fact still remains that these therapies are still in clinical trial there is no hard evidence to suggest that this is something that can be used uh, now having said that it is also important to to state this fact that by giving plasma or giving antibodies uh, is only going to handle the individual immediate or acute infection that's not going to confer the individual a prolonged sort of immunity to the particular vac particular vaccine or a particular uh, pathogen so it is not something like a vaccine which produces a sort of prolonged immune response it, it's only used in handling the acute infection but having said that this all these therapies are still in clinical trials Uh, there's a large trial happening in the United States, and ICMR has today just announced a call for organizations who are interested in enrolling for a large-scale clinical trial. Great, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vinod. I mean, uh, uh, my next question is something you know more towards uh, the genealogical perspective. If you really look into uh, all the 31 states of India, and uh, maybe you know a few other uh, you know uh, union territories. Uh, you, you find a lot of variation in terms of the number of cases, you know, in terms of the acute cases or uh, the kind of you know, cases you know prevailing with with, with COVID. Um, uh, of course, you know, there is no good research you know going on uh, with respect to uh, uh, whether or not you know the temperature plays a very important role for this. Um, so, do you think that you know we, by virtue of you know our dietary habits and the kind of you know uh the eating habits or the kind of you know uh spiced food that we usually uh, take right, uh, right 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 from day one uh, are we are we are we uh, are we prone to you know uh inherit you know some kind of you know, resistance you know, for this kind of you know very day can you can you please throw light on uh, on these particular lines yeah, yeah so to, to put facts across uh, at this moment there is no therapy no agent Uh, no intervention which is known to cure the condition in an absolute sense these are all still hypotheses that need to be validated going forward right right uh, yeah thank you vinod uh, uh, sir and ma'am would you like to uh, chip in with any of these comments here on this uh, if you have any thoughts on this yeah mm -hmm. they, they... Sort of you know, early observations uh, and uh, sort of hypothesis, as Vinod said, but we don't have any conclusive data. But probably we know what we can mine uh, or should mine into is uh, you know our uh, diversity pertaining to uh, the immunoglobulin and uh, MHC HLA uh, you know uh, receptors, and uh, try to see if that can provide us some answer in terms of our. genetic diversity pertaining to the you know immune diversity and if that is that uh, you know has any advantage uh, uh, over uh, you know many other things right yeah, right yeah of, of course that is uh, quite relevant but 
the unfortunate thing is that what protects or what doesn't protect is going to be always retrospective analysis, right? Of course, of course. I mean, uh, it, it's impossible to take up any study of this scale in a span of, uh, you know, three months and then to come out with conclusive right. uh, you know, uh, evidence that can be backed by data. I do right. understand. But this is how I thought uh, that, you know, uh, the epidemiological data and the viral genomic diversity uh, can be correlated with uh, the human genome diversity that, you know, the project that you have been uh, spearheading. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any quick comments, sir? Uh, Srinivasan, sir? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, see, um, yeah, you know, these pathogens, including viruses, are known to mutate, uh, perhaps in reaction to two factors. One is, suppose uh, there is a, a intervention. So, uh, I mean, there's a human intervention in terms of drug. Uh, well, it might generate a drug-resistant strain. That is one kind of mutation. And second, it is uh, also, uh, it cannot be precluded that um, the virus mutates depending upon the genomic makeup of the host. Um, and this is far from understood um, for many pathogens. You leave alone uh, the recent hero, um, uh, you know, uh, the COVID-19. Um, so this is uh, it's an extremely important area, but we are far from understanding this. And uh, as uh, you know, Vinod said, uh, uh, you know, the understanding and the implementation of our understanding should be such that uh, it, it should be you know, preventable rather than uh, the retrospective, um, um, uh, you know, uh, learning um, that is less useful. So uh, I think it's an important area, but we have a long way to go. Srinivasan, currently. Uh, there are no drugs, so there is no chance that we can think about uh, in future how this virus is going to mutate in response to the drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. But RNA viruses, they have high mutation rate as part of you know uh, mm -hmm. just their sheer replication, and mm -hmm. that is how they gather those uh, you know variations. Some are retained, most of them are thrown out. But the point I was trying to make. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to we know that you know if we know uh, the the genetic uh, diversity and repertoire of immune related genes in the human, then that can help us uh, sort of uh, um, position or prioritize some of the candidates for the vaccine uh, taken into consideration. Diversity of both the virus as well as you know the host to diversity. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the vaccine, there are two things that need to keep in. We need to keep in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing is, of course, the immunogenicity of a particular viral protein or a viral Correct. antigen Absolutely. to the host system. Absolutely. The second, even more important thing, is that whether this immunogenicity is protective enough to be able to handle the virus. And both of them are not essentially the same. So, you can have, have, have a very strong antigen which could elicit yeah. a very strong antibody response. But if yeah. the antibody response cannot control the invading pathogen, then that is of absolutely no use, right? And right. then of course, on top of it, there's this added complexity that the virus is mutating, mm -hmm. right? The virus mutates right. approximately, accumulates one mutation in the 30,000 odd bases once in yeah. every 10 days or so. Yeah. And of course, that is the information that we extensively use to look at viral phylogeny or what we call as molecular contact tracing, because you can sequence virus from one individual and now yeah. be able to tell from where did this individual get the virus. Did yeah. you get it from Europe? Did you get it from the, the Arab countries? Did you get it from Italy? Did you get it from UK? So on and so forth. Right. right. Now, uh, now, having said this, as a virus is mutating, the, the added challenge is that it is a never-ending game that you will never get at a point in time where you will exhaust all possible viral variants to be able to design a perfect vaccine. So vaccine design should and vaccine production should continue. But of course, with the idea that we should factor in the viral variability as we go forward. 
yeah the yeah. perfect vaccine as you said is not possible but you know to be able to put together a formulation that can help you know uh, the population uh, to combat with the infection would and should you know be looked at as a immediate uh, target that's right, that's right. So, so you can always optimize and uh, tweak and make it perfect later but as a first line defense we need to have you know something yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, Vinod, and sir. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, you know, Professor Ratnagiri couldn't uh, get connected, you know, because of some technical reasons, but he's on phone with me here. Um, uh, and I put, uh, 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 you know, the phone on speaker mode. So, uh, sir, you now if you can hear me, I'm just, you know, putting this phone over here, uh, near the mic over here. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, uh, what kind of, you know, uh, challenges uh, or how difficult is it, you know, to come up with a kind of a novel diagnostic kit uh, for uh, for coronavirus? Could you please throw light on this? Yeah. Yes. Basically, there are two kinds of kits. Uh, some uh, the diagnostic kits people they usually focus on. One is confirmatory test, that is the molecular biology based test. One is real time PCR, which is very commonly used right now. The other one is PCR based, normal routine PCR, reverse transfer based coupled PCR. The second line of diagnostic kits, which are very important right now at this stage in the world, are the zero diagnostic or antigen detection. The reason is a country like India, where there are 130 crores of people are there, and screening by using the real time PCR is not going to happen that easily because the technology itself is more expensive and cumbersome. It takes a long time and also the chemicals and total number of steps are involved are a little bit more. It takes one day to give the result. So to screen thousands of people in a country like India, it is very difficult. So important thing is to do the screening for the zero diagnostics, which are more easy, robust, simple, easy, inexpensive. How it is going to happen? Just take our pregnancy kit and where we can do the zero diagnostic either IgG or IgM, and the same rapid kit you can do it, or else the ELISA, where you can do 90 samples at a time. It means at least 90 samples you can do in two to three hours. So, this kind of technology is also available right now in the country, and several people, several companies are embarking on this kind of thing. And within next 10 days, most probably you are going to see the second wave of technology is coming into the market. A lot of kids, either indigenous or imported from other countries, they are going to come semi-finished or finished product. So the country is going to face that kind of thing. And these kind of things are very essential because what happens is you may not directly detect a uh, virus, but at least you can see the response of the IgG, IgM in the patient, so they are asymptomatic sometimes when, uh, after the incubation period of the seven or eight days, you can see IgM coming in as well as IgG also coming in. You are going to see positivity for that. First thing what you have is take a person, put them in the uh, quarantine and test them by doing the real-time PCR. Confirm that one rather than doing the real-time PCR in general population or uh, prone areas because there is going to be, we are going to find one out of 100 or one out of 40 or one out of 50. But here, whoever is positive for the zero diagnostic, you can immediately ask them to go for the um, test for the QPCR and confirm the whole thing. Hello? Right, sir. Right, sir. Perfect, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, there are, there are a couple of questions. Right, so there the, are the a couple of more questions, sir. You know, thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Yeah. Right, sir. Uh, so, uh, could you please throw light on the plasma therapy, sir? I think Vinod has wonderfully uh, pointed uh, on that. Uh, do you have a comment, anything on uh, plasma intervention therapy that is currently going on? I think I couldn't hear what uh, I was not uh, listening to what Vinod uh, mentioned. Most probably he might be the same thing, what I cannot share too much than that because uh, now it is coming the plasma uh, therapy as you propose. Most probably, I think if I remember correctly, you are the first person to got 
is to my attention. Right, right sir. Right. I think two weeks, two weeks back. Maybe right, not sir. the right person to address that right now. Uh, right, sir. Yeah. Not up it very well. Right. Time. Right. Uh, and we are thinking about the project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm just an opportunist, uh, opportune uh, uh, viral biologist. I just ventured into viral biologist just because of COVID. But uh, I'll, I'll have my point on that later. Uh, but sir, one quick comment. Uh, uh, what is the best advice uh, you would give someone who is venturing towards diagnostic in intervention for novel coronavirus? You know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, budding entrepreneurs who wanted to really come up with diagnostics. So, uh, so you have almost, you know, uh, uh, five decades of rich experience in this area. So what kind of, uh, you know, suggestions, suggestions you could give to the budding scientists? Right. Yeah. Yes. And what they have to do is uh, go and pull out all those four genes out of 27 genes. And what are the epitopes that are more exposed to the uh, normal uh, immunogenic point of view? So there are those the areas in the virus, viron. What are the epitopes that may be immunogenic, highly immunogenic? Why we are talking immunogenic? Because that's where your antibodies are going to be stuck. Right. Identify the and, um, epitope. And that epitope, if we can identify, that can be used by two different ways. One, we can detect the antigen. The second one is the antibody detection. You want to do the antigen detection. You have to have two antibodies in your hand, either to do the ELISA or else rapid diagnostic. To develop these kind of kits, antigen detection, you have to have either monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies. The most important one, what we can do is pass plan. You can take one of the patients who has gone through uh, the disease, infected with the disease and recovered, take the case, blood sample, puppy coat. Isolate the B cells, prepare the fast library, and then you can have battery of antibodies, human antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. You can develop and use them to detect coronavirus in the uh, swamp, natural swamp, or any other places where you can identify the uh, pathogen in the body. So, that is a one easy way of doing the diagnostic. Nobody, I mean, several people may be thinking it is like. That is one opportunity. The other opportunity is take those four genes, what I mentioned before. These are having up to 78% to 99% homology with uh, other uh, corona um, family. So pick up the area, construct the one gene, which is going to be, you can design this, uh, uh, pick up those areas of the different genes, and assemble them, make a synthetic gene, construct it, make a synthetic gene, then your file bulk and use it as a epitope <coughs> to detect the antibodies, IgG-ICM. This can be done very easily within one or two months. Right. Even right. if you start now. Right, right. That is a fast pace. Right, right. Uh, and there are several other things you can do, ELISA this kit, or you can do the rapid diagnostic for the IgG, IgM, or as, as it is, you can detect, you can make the specific epitopes only specific for COVID-19. Right, sir. And you can make it. Right, yeah. right. Uh, perfect, sir. Thank you and so much. And is also important. Yeah. Uh, so the, that was my next question, which you all, already started answering that. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, Aptama-based uh, entity, which, you know, uh, which we are fortunate that, you know, I'm working with Professor Ratnagiri on this. Maybe I'll, I'll throw some lights on this uh, uh, later. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, we know the um, uh, ma'am and uh, Professor Srinivasan said, Do you have any quick comments on this? Uh, any, any, any quick comments? Um, not really. Yeah, can you make me to join in this? Uh, yes, sir. I think, I think, uh, sir, if you have if you have joined, I'll, I'll add you, sir. I'm putting up the phone as of now, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, just just give me a minute, please. Yeah, um, I hope I hope it was audible. Uh, his voice. Yeah. Yeah, it was okay. Uh, yeah, one minute, please. I'm just you no. Know, I think he's is here. One minute. Yeah. 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 I've got my
uh, I think uh, he hasn't joined, but I'm just you know, trying to uh, start his camera. Yeah, uh, but in the meantime, uh, probably I'll just uh, ask questions from the audience. I think, you know, it's been one hour, uh, nine minutes from our discussions. So uh, I think uh, uh, I've selectively chosen in a few questions here. So probably I'll try to uh, pose some uh, questions. Uh, one question was uh, to uh, Professor uh, Urmila Kulkani Kale from uh, Vijay Lakujani uh, from Newburgh Center for Genomic Medicine. He says that you know we have a huge task force of bioinformatics professionals in India who are highly skilled as well as professional in terms of handling sequencing data. So in the crucial lockdown time, uh, where do you think you know how do you think you know that this structural analysis can uh, can be done uh, in a meaningful or in a in a more you know uh, directive manner uh, so so do you have any uh, quick answer for this ma'am to vijay yeah, yeah. thanks vijay for uh, you know um, sort of uh, taking initiative to uh, ask this question as to what can really be done while we are under the lockdown so well uh, you know direct answer to your question is uh, some of us like uh, at Pune uh, University Bioinformatics Center, you know, some of us are, uh, you know, working at home, uh, from home, and trying to put some pieces of this jigsaw puzzle together. Uh, but you know, uh, it can be done at a at a larger scale, as you have indicated, and we can pull in uh, students uh, from uh, different, uh, you know, universities or those who have registered with BioClues or, you know, make it in general open. Uh, but in order to uh, do so and to sort of translate this into a meaningful activity, some of us should, uh, you know, uh, take up the task of uh, identifying and prioritizing uh, the questions and the tasks that one would like to undertake. And only then it can be sort of crowdsource if I understand your intentions right, uh, wherein we uh, sort of involve large number of students uh, in this analysis. So two objectives would be would be fulfilled. One is uh, we, 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 we get, you know, uh, to ask more questions uh, than we can individually uh, take up. And second, in the process, it would help, you know, uh, to uh, for students to have some runtime, uh, you know, mini project experience uh, in terms of data curation, in terms of, you know, phylogeny, in terms of uh, epitope prediction, structural modeling, uh, you know, drug design, repurposing. We can identify some areas and can have these projects uh, floated. I guess. Uh, I think this is what uh, I could think of uh, post, you know, reading your query, which Prash had also forwarded and shared it to me. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, my question um, uh, next to uh, next is you know, to Vinod. In fact, now this is a question posed by Dwarkadish and Mohan Kumar. In fact, I'm just clubbing these two questions. Uh, their questions are you know more related to something like you know, can we artificially create a virus uh, in house in the lab? Uh, and uh, probably, you know, put a protein coat around it and uh, uh, make it functional so that, you know, we can understand, you know, how it behaves. And uh, something on uh, uh, on these lines, you know, maybe, maybe if we can um, know whether or not, uh, uh, if this is, you know, uh, intermittently transfected, uh, maybe, you know, it might even, you know, release some kind of, you know, viral immunity, you know, say from dead body to, you know, uh, you know, from a living body or vice versa. So, uh, so uh, something, something on these lines, you know, you know, if you could answer. Yeah, you could synthesize a virus, you could create a new virus, but the, the real big question is why would you want to do that? And at, at what, yeah. uh, what kind of biosafety would you want to do that? Um, right. In terms right. of, you know, medical issues as well. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe, you know. Probably, uh, probably yeah, this, this question also comes from the background discussion that is going on, you know, with respect to whether this particular virus is a synthetic construct, a bioweapon or things like right, that. Right, right. Yeah? So, so uh, the clear answer to that question is no. Uh, you right. know, they, our work and the work of many others, which is there in the public domain, you know, right. clearly states that it has, uh, it's a natural evolution. This virus is a product of natural evolution. 
and there are no conclusive evidences that it is a synthetic construct. Right. Right, I just right. thought that I could supplement because I think students have this type of questions in mind when they're asking us, uh, you know. Right, right, uh, right. Uh, so uh, there is another uh, uh, question uh, to be known uh, and probably Srinivasan sir as well. Um, in fact, you know, uh, uh, something you know, more towards, you know, those uh, genomic sequences that are being published. Uh, are these uh, uh, sequences, you know, uh, related to nasal microbiome of Indian communities or, uh, or, or are we mapping them back to any of the known uh, sequences you know, that are publicly available? Uh, so as, are you asking the question uh, about the sequences from India that's already deposited? Yeah, 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 yeah yes, sir. But, you know, that okay. is a question you know, from uh, Harpreet you know, to you. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah, so as far as I know, the first two sequences which are deposited by the National Institute of Virology were from nasal samples and were directly sequenced. And that's what essentially the paper uh, on, the, on the IGMR says about those sequences. Right. Uh, but having said that, uh, now we have 28 sequences in total uh, from India. Um, as of the last update, half an hour ago. Um, right. And all, almost all the additional sequences were from cell cultures. Uh, so these are near pure viral isolates, which could mm -hmm. be sequenced. That's exciting. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for this. You know, something you know more towards um, uh, a generic point of view. You know, f you know, you know, from lung infection. Uh, Anisha, who is a graduate student, you know, she asks. Um, you know, uh, you know, there is a lot of you know drug targets and approaches you know for producing a proper vaccine, and uh, we know that you know the persons who have uh, uh, who have been you know uh, victims or who have succumbed to COVID are those you know, whose lungs were filled with you know, inflammatory uh, uh, material you know, into the lungs. A lot of you know, inflammation you know, getting onto the lungs and uh, they're not you know, able to get oxygen. So uh, do you think you know, that uh, these drugs could really make sense uh, in really stopping this uh, inflammatory response? Can we, can we also you know, uh, uh, dock some of these particular drugs in-house you know, so that you know, we can better identify you know, potential drug targets? Yeah, hello. You are you are asking this question to Vinod, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, also to you, sir. Also to you as well, please. Yeah. Uh, three of you. A a anyone could respond. Uh, respond, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, you know the lung. Um, I mean, the undesirable things can happen to lung due to different pathogens. Um, and you know the the final effect could be same. What is you know clinically observed uh, could be the same effect. Um, but you know uh, any um, any intervention, human intervention to these natural processes should be specialized on the pathogen that is responsible for this problem with the lungs. So uh, I, I'm um, I'm not able to uh, support the idea of you know something very common. Um, it's, it's, I mean, the same drug or something that will uh, that will um, address the different kinds of infection that will lead to the same sort of a clinical uh, symptoms and effect. Uh, so each one is a separate problem, in my view. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, how about you, ma'am, or Vinod? Yeah. I think Vinod should take up that question. Being a clinician, he will be able to. I think Professor Srinivasan has sort of mentioned it quite appropriately. Right, right, yeah. Uh, so uh, one final question which I would like to uh, pose you know, on behalf of Shivakant, who, who has asked this. He asked several questions, but one interesting question probably is uh, that the natural genesis of novel viruses seem to be an inevitable evolutionary process. Can we assume that the era of viruses has begun and the very sustenance of human life is at stake? I didn't get your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, he, he asked whether, you know, can we assume that the era of viruses, you know, uh, attacking the humans has begun and the very sustenance of human life is at stake. Uh, the other way around is, can we, uh, uh, can we have one vaccine you know, that could, you know, combat all these viruses? 
it's very unlikely that you will have one vaccine that can combat every every known virus. Uh, that looks very improbable. Um, and pathogens have always been there with humans, and yeah, we have always had a sort of friendly or unfriendly coevolution. Yes. Um, each time trying to surpass each other at each uh, each uh, episode of uh, interaction with each other. So I think uh, it is not like uh, that one virus is going to finish humankind, right? Some viruses are going to spread in the population, of course, and people eventually are going to get immune to it. Or, of course, people are going to find a drug for it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, this, yeah. These viruses uh, are dependent on, um, on their host for their multiplication. And without host, they, they can't exist. So um, I think in a very uh, general, in a logical thinking says that, um, you know, the evolution of an organism, which is dependent on its survival and multiplication on another organism, cannot be killing the host organism. Um, you know, perhaps the current uh, COVID-19 is a bit stupid, uh, you know, killing humans. You know, in a in a in an ideal, in a very philosophical sense, it wants to live, as you know, says in uh, harmony with humans, uh, because they also have to live. If they have to live, humans have to live. Yeah. So as it has been very, uh, you know, very beautifully uh, put in context by both, uh, you know, Professor Srinivasan and we know. Uh, but you know, uh, viruses have been around, and some of them have been. Uh, coming back as re-emerging virus infection. So probably what uh, one needs to actually do is to sort of, uh, you know, be prepared in terms of, uh, you know, our preparedness uh, with respect to handling these viruses and the viral infection in a better fashion uh, than, you know, really uh, uh, be sort of uh, taking it as and when you know they are coming and hitting us with uh, a big bang. A bang. So uh, one part is to take some lessons and to develop the preparedness uh, is what uh, we need to do. And that preparedness could be management, could be epidemiology, could be you know development of kids. But no, as we say that uh, one size is not going to fit all. There can't be one. Uh, miracle drug that would cure or treat uh, viruses. Similarly, there can't be one, uh, you know, single vaccine that could uh, provide us immunity uh, against all viruses. And we have to, I think, look at in a more holistic perspective in terms of human and uh, the environment of human with, uh, I mean, human and their environment with with animals, with plants, and the and and you know the biosphere as a whole. Uh, in terms of you know management of uh, you know outbreaks of pathogens like this, right, right, um, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that answers your question, uh, Seema Marwa. Uh, I think you know this is something you know more on your questions like what are the chances of you know lifetime uh, uh, immunity after getting you know uh, once infected with you know COVID virus and all. So I think you know uh, that begs you know some kind of you know answers towards this. Uh, but you know, my uh, next point, you know, a quick discussion is, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, works, you know, the last three four days, where you know, uh, uh, it is believed that you know there could be infection of uh, coronavirus, you know, from animal to humans, which means like could be zoonosis, so it could be a zoonotic virus. So, uh, how, how critical it is uh, to understand the lateral gene transfer uh, from uh, these particular, uh, uh, you know, animals you know, to the humans. I mean, do you think, you know, that uh, the horizontal gene transfer or the lateral gene transfer plays a very important role? Uh, do you think, you know, that any of these uh, uh, microbial genomes or animal genomes, you know, that have been studied uh, could be uh, you know, could be uh, could be uh, at least you know uh, colloquially searched for identifying certain genes that have been transferred from you know those species you know to the, uh, to, to humans you know for, you know for, uh, for, for for infection of viruses. Yeah. So inclusion of retroviral genomes is something that uh, we are uh, aware of, uh, right. but 
uh, but uh, you know, through these viruses like COVID, we don't expect uh, you know horizontal gene transfer event uh, with respect to uh, you know humans or you know the animal genomes to be incorporated in human genome. They, I mean, it's not going to happen that way. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And one final question probably uh, from Ruma Benerji of CDAC. Uh, she asks, has a virus mutated across uh, human population to change, change its binding affinity to the uh, ACE2 receptors? Say it again, please. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, I, 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 you I, I, repeat the question. Yeah, I, I, I quote again. She asks, uh, as the virus mutated across the human population, to change the binding affinity to the ACE2 receptors? I think it is quite possible. Uh, yes. Because if you take the predecessor of uh, SARS-CoV-2, that is SARS-CoV, um, um, I get the impression from the literature that the affinity b b between uh, uh, COV and uh, ACE2 of, of human uh, is... Um, somewhat lower than the COV2 and the ACE2. So if it has happened already, if it is true, what I'm saying is, uh, uh, is really correct, uh, which, is, which is the impression I get, um, then it is already happening in the evolution of the viruses. So there's no reason why you have, uh, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is possible theoretically, I would say, that um, as, um, as the virus mutates uh, in reaction to human, genomic um, uh, um, uh, data, I mean, genomic um, uh, organization, it's possible that you can have variations in the affinity to ACE2, which is possible, but I mean, unless you see it, you can't be sure about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much you know, for your time. Uh, so uh, the last uh, three, four minutes, I'll just quickly summarize you know, what uh, uh, we at BioClues and probably you know, the Lyme Institute of Scientific Research uh, have been doing on this area up front ever since we got this outbreak. So uh, uh, I've been interested in uh, computationally designing uh, aptamers. Aptamers are small molecules you know, that can probably replace antibodies. So um, from my uh, uh, heydays of uh, postdoc time in 2009, uh, I've been involved in designing uh, a lot of you know, uh, aptamers, you know, thanks to my postdoctoral mentor, uh, with whom you know, we have designed uh, some kind of aptamers you know, for uh, uh, for a few uh, 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 human genome targets, uh, and they were uh, all in autoimmune diseases, you know, including lupus and uh, other, other, other diseases, but not really uh, the viruses. Uh, but um, this aptamer research has really uh, helped me understand and design you know, some kind of you know, aptamers uh, for these um, uh, NSP10 uh, proteins. Uh, you might wonder that, you know, there are four structural proteins as uh, beautifully stated by the four panelists today. So there are structural proteins, but um, uh, there are also non-structural proteins uh, where, you know, right from uh, ORF1AB and also, you know, some aspects of NSP1 to NSP10, uh, they uh, uh, allow, uh, allow the uh, proteins to replicate. And so that, that really... Uh, for example, NSP10, you know, primarily helps another particular, you know, viral particle, you know, to uh, assimilate inside the body. So we need to stop that. So if we can identify a, a good target for that, then, you know, that would be, you know, wonderful. There are some antibody-based therapies. There are some antibodies, you know, that have been targeted, you know, against uh, the structural proteins, but not really the NSP10 or NSP2 or NSP3 proteins. So we in our lab, you know, we try to computationally design these aptamers and we have synthesized these particular aptamers in our lab. And thanks to Professor Ratnagiri, you know, who has uh, significantly helped us in um, uh, checking this, you know, from select space strategies. So select is a kind of uh, uh, a selection strategy where we'll be able to know whether or not, you know, two molecules, you know, bind, bind to each other. So uh, this, you know, we are uh, trying to validate in, in, in the lab as of now. And if we can do that, probably, you know, uh, uh, you know we could uh, potentially uh, uh, replace, you know, uh, 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 antibodies, you know, with aptamers. So that's one of the, you know, kind of uh, questions, you know, that we are trying to address at this point of time. And as I uh, told you, I'm not just, a, I'm not a viral biologist, I'm just a systems genetics. So uh, from systems genetics and systems genomics point of view, we just try to ask a lot of questions.
tomorrow we are going to have another webinar with uh, uh, with uh, Gitinath Pillai, uh, with whom you know uh, uh, I'm I'm presenting you know our preliminary results uh, you know uh, tomorrow. And if you can see uh, in the screenshot here, uh, this is a simplest uh, circular uh, phylogenetic uh, uh, tree uh, that was drawn. And uh, although you know there's no big difference uh, from uh, the two isolates of India, uh, I see that you know uh, uh, many a time you know, when uh, uh, the, assembly, uh, the assembly is done. Um, the assembly is really done in a very uh, 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 unscrupulous fashion. So we need to just check at least you know ten to twelve different uh, assemblies or uh, genomes you know, from India. So for which you know we need you know uh, raw rates. So once we have raw rates, probably you know we can use you know uh, several methods like the inpatient based approaches and the patient based, uh, and the and the, um, uh, and, the, and the very detail-based, uh, you know, assembly-based approaches, and then identify, you know, some kind of, you know, targets uh, using, you know, different tools, come up with a good assembly. So, where, you know, we'll be getting the assembly, you know, somewhere between 29.3 uh, uh, KB region uh, uh, of, of, of the viral uh, genome. And then, you know, ask uh, what is or how variable are these particular strains when compared to, you know, when compared to, uh, the already existing in you know, a 132 complete assemblies. So, uh, and, and I think, you know, from India perspective, you know, my point was maybe, you know, Vinod would also agree, agree to my point, you know, uh, a country like China could, uh, uh, could sequence and publish uh, 106 uh, genomes ever since, you know, the outbreak came into picture. So, which means, it is, it is absolutely, you know, they, they worked on a very, you know, uh, a speedy basis, which means they just started isolating the RNA. They went on, you know, sequencing it and they published it, you know, uh, to GenBank, you know, by evening. Probably we in India, we are not really, probably not that prepared, you know, as, as, as China is, uh, but, uh, but it's really, you know, a kind of in a sorry state of uh, uh, figures where, you know, we just got only two samples, uh, you know, the last, you know, probably, you know, uh, you know, uh, 33 days of an outbreak in India. So probably we need to we need to be more prepared. You know, from the genomics perspective, we need to uh, uh, you know bridge the gap. As we know, you know, rightly points out, you know, it's not just in the clinicians and the, and the geneticists. It's also you know uh, you know every uh, uh, every uh, every laborer who works you know towards you know, development of these uh, uh, entities. Now this was you know my 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 uh, final uh, point on this. And um, I think you know, we should stop over here. I think it's 4.32 p.m. Uh, we, should, uh, we should thank all the four panelists you know, with a wonderful uh, uh, round of applause. Uh, we sincerely thank, um, uh, thank you all, uh, sirs and ma'am. Um, thank you, Professor Srinivasan. Thank you, Professor Ratnagiri, um, uh, Professor Mila Kulkani Kale, and um, uh, of course, Dr. Vinod Skaria, who, is, uh, uh, who has really taken out their you know, busy, busy time you know, uh, uh, you know, spending this time. And on a serious note, you know, you 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 will be you will be surprised to know that you know we know that has been in IGIB ever since you know, the outbreak uh, as uh, uh, as uh, as come. So he stays there for one week, you know, doing yeoman service, you know, developing you know these kind of you know uh, different resources, maintaining the resources and all. And so is Professor Ratnagiri. He is a task force member of DBT and several Virat based projects. He has been running helter skelter, you know, driving from. Uh, you know, Hyderabad to uh, Guntur and from his lab, you know, to Vishakhapatnam, you know, almost, you know, once in two days, you know, and he is, is, is you know, working, you know, towards, you know, development of these diagnostic kits. So, and also the same applies with Professor Srinivasan and Professor Mila Kulkani Kale. It's unfortunate that we got about 148 registrants and only 49 or 15, you know, were active today. Um, uh, I think, you know, many of them would probably listen to the uh, recorded uh, uh, session which we'll put up in our YouTube page of BioClose. Okay, uh, so thank you so much. So if there are no uh, questions, I know there are a few hands raised, but uh, I apologize for this. Uh, we don't have time uh, today. Uh, I just want to add that uh, on behalf of all the, all the panelists and all the participants, we would like to thank you, Prish, for this great initiative and uh, uh, taking uh, it on your shoulders and uh, planning it so very well with trial sessions. And I think it went on extremely well. And I hope uh, the participants uh, have learned something uh, from this discussion today. And uh, you know, thank you for uh, make, making all this 
uh, happen. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You know, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, uh, yeah, thank you again, all of you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod, again. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, all the participants. You know, uh, you know, heartening to see uh, to see all of you. And uh, there are some uh, you know, questions that are not answered. Probably we'll just you know, try to answer you by email. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.